Before we get into the message this morning, I want to compliment someone that has distinguished themselves in a huge way, Miss Connie Alanis. Miss Connie had uh, her retirement ceremony this last week. Miss Connie, there has been hundreds and hundreds of students that come through your classroom, and you have made an impact on many, 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 many people. And I want to congratulate you on your retirement. And uh, I know that uh, some of these students look back. Uh, no doubt you were one of their favoritest teachers. And I know that uh, you had an impact on our kids. James had you as well and uh, as, as one of his classes. And uh, Miss Connie, I want to gra- congratulate you. You've done a wonderful, wonderful job. And we wish you the, w- wish you the best. And I know that uh, when we say retirement, that just means you move from one job to another job. I, I, I realize that. But Miss Connie, we are so proud of you. So very, very, very much. Yeah. And also, we want to just remember Brother Paul and uh, as he lost his mom. And uh, Brother Paul came back to be a part of this service today. And Brother Paul, I know it would have been so easy for you to uh, be with your family this weekend. But we compliment you, sir, and we pray for you. And what a uh, difficult time to lose your mom right around Mother's Day. So uh, we, we thank you for being here as well. And at the conclusion of the service, ladies, we'd like to remind you that uh, we do have something to present to you. And Brother Paul will have those. So when you walk out of the room this morning, make sure that you see Brother Paul. He'll give you a memento of uh, this Mother's Day. Now, he told me this. He said, Preacher, let's hand those out after the service, because if you do it in the service, the ladies will play with it all through the service. So uh, so we're just uh, we're, we're blaming Brother Paul on this. And so uh, just make sure that uh, you see him as you leave. And uh been a good day already. We thank you for being in, in your place. For many, this is a special day. And if your mother is still living, it's a chance for you to tell her thank you for putting up with you and not killing you when you was a teenager. All over the world today, sermons will be preached on motherhood and the blessings that mothers have given to each of us. And if you come from a Christian home, then you know your mother's was indispensable. You had no greater prayer warrior and someone who loved you unconditionally. Now, this is not our text verse, but we do want you to mention this because it is a popular uh, verse all throughout uh, the Mother's Day season. But in Proverbs chapter 31, verse number 26, we'll just give you a characteristic of of, uh, uh, of a mother here. Proverbs thirty one twenty six. Bible says, and she opened her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Look at verse twenty seven. And she looked well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. And many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Go ahead, Phil. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. Look at this. But a woman that Feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Today, the role of motherhood has changed. It used to be that moms had the luxury of staying at home and raising her children. In many cases, that role switches to the grandparents if the mother has to work out of the home today. And the demands on moms has only increased. When you come in from work, you still must balance the children's demands and Women, you know this, if you've got children at home, those demands are great. But women, you also know this, you've got the biggest child at home, and that's your husband. Usually you've got to, uh, uh, you've got to pamper. I found some quotes on motherhood. Phil, if you'll get those ready on the screen. I found some quotes on motherhood. Phil, are you ready? There you go. It says this, My kids will walk, walk right past their father sitting on the couch and come bang on the shower door for me to open a fruit snack. Number two, number two, number two. All right. My kids call it yelling when I raise my voice, but I call it motivational speaking for the selective hearing. Good moms let you lick the beaters, 
Great moms turn them off first. Don't you love that one? Don't you love that one? I love that one. I'm pretty sure that my kids think the word no means to ask mom repeatedly until she either changes her mind or loses it. I want all my children to have all the things I can't afford. Then I will move in with them. Amen. The quickest way for a parent to get a child's attention is to sit down and look comfortable. And I put this one in for Carla. If you are the baby of the family, feel honored. It means your parents finally made the perfect child, so they stopped at you. <laughs> Woo-wee! Yeah, amen, amen, amen. All right. Hey, you got to have a little liberty sometimes when you're digging this stuff up, all right? By the way, if you are the baby of the family, let me just see your hands. Let me see your hands. Not too many on this side of the room. There's something wrong with all of them. All right, so babies of the family... You're privileged. You know that when growing up, when you had a major problem, it was usually mom who came to your rescue. And often, because of those memories, uh, those things will stay with you for a lifetime. Today, the title of the message is Mama's Boys. And we're going to learn about some Mama's Boys in our Bibles. Those lessons our mothers taught them that stayed with them for a very long time. Our first mama's boy was someone named Timothy. And the lessons he learned from his grandmother and his, or excuse me, his mother and grandmother. 2 Timothy chapter 1, if you will. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let's look at this uh, first mama's boy we're going to look at, and I think you'll enjoy these this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number Three. All right. Let me get where I need to be. It help. Excuse me, Second Timothy. Did I say First Timothy? Oh, I'm sorry. It. All right. Just go to Second Timothy. I think I've messed up on the screen. All right. Just go to First Second Timothy, chapter one. And verse number three, and I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience and without ceasing. I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears that I might be filled with joy. Look at verse number five. When I call to remembrance, watch the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which look dwelt first in thy grandmother, Lois, and thy mother, Eunice. And I am persuaded that in thee also. Look at verse number 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. We understand that uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse number 5, the word sincere. was There was, listen, there was something in Timothy's mother that knew the importance. Here's my first uh, major thought I want you to get from these mama's boys is the first thought is the word faith. The first word is the word faith. Timothy's mother and grandmother taught this young man faith. There was something in them that had, uh, had, had moral conviction. There was something in these ladies that was able to translate that to this young Timothy. He would look for them for guidance. And can I tell you this, and you might as well learn this lesson now. When all around you breaks loose, as sometimes it does, it will be your faith that comes to your rescue. Amen. How does that work for you? Simply this. Once the Lord makes the statement, He never changes His mind. I want to show you something. Mark chapter 11, verse number 22. Mark chapter 11 and verse number 22. Notice what your Bible says. And Jesus answering saith unto them, underscore this, Jesus is saying this, this is important, so he says this, have faith in God. Now listen to this, that simply means that the promises are God are true and you can have complete confidence in them. The Lord tries to teach us daily to use our faith and we are, listen to this, we are made in his image, we are made in his likeness. 
And he has a plan and a desire for each and every one of you in this room. Now listen to me. I don't want you to miss this and just gloss this over because typically these are messages for, for our moms. These are lessons that moms taught their sons and their sons are teaching us this morning. So the first lesson that we are learning is the word faith. And I want to just tell you this. There's been some times in your life, if I could point out anybody in this room, and I would ask you this question, many of you could stand up and say this. If I could just ask you this question, what role has faith played in your life when you've gone through a very severe difficulty or severe trial in your life? You know what you would say to me? You'd say, if it wasn't for my faith, I could have never got through. If it wasn't for that I had something solid, and concrete. I could have never done and got through these difficult situations. I'm thinking of people in our church that have really gone through some difficult times. Miss Missy, for one, losing her mom. Somebody that she was close to, somebody she cared for for years and years and years. You think of Miss Wilson that's gone and and, and the things that uh, Missy is going through. We think of Brother Gene Mount losing his wife of all of those years, his helpmate and companion. And I I can tell you, it was his faith that carried him through. And Brother Paul has stood up in our pastor's class this morning and said that he was able to tell his siblings, his family, the only way to Jesus Christ, the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ and a personal belief in him. Amen. See, these people are going through rock solid difficulties, but here's what they've understood. If it wasn't for their faith in Almighty God that they understood his promises are true, it was true for from the moment Jesus said it, and they are true today. Amen. Yeah. These are some things that that uh, uh, that the mother and the grandmother was teaching Timothy, and Paul was reiterating that to this young man and saying this: Never lose sight of that, Timothy. Never lose sight of God's purpose. One of these days that you're going to understand. Maybe your faith is not as strong now as it will be. And can I tell you something? Are you listening this morning? Whoa, 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 whoa. Are you listening this morning? Here's what I've learned. My faith about 10 or 20 years ago isn't near what it is today. And you know why? Because I've had a whole lot of things that I've had to go through and I've had to lean on Jesus Christ for that. It wasn't because of I could do anything on my own. It was during those times that I asked God to come and do something and do something in my life and do something in this church or do something with individuals. And it was in those things that I learned God's precious promises are absolutely true. Amen, preacher. Listen to this. Remember, faith grows out of God's Word. To develop your faith, you have to feed your heart constantly the Word of God. The Word of God is not some fairy tales designed to entertain you. It's designed to strengthen you, to speak to your heart, and get you through the darkest of times. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Everybody look up here just a minute. This is not sleep time. This is the Word of God time. One more time. The Word of God is designed to equip you to get you through the darkest of times. Amen. Timothy learned faith from his mother, but can I show you something that another mama's boy learned? Turn, if you will, to Luke chapter 1, verse number 5. Timothy learned faith. Let me show you what another mama's boy learned. Luke chapter 1, verse number 5. There were in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias. Of course, of Avi and his wife was the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Underscore that. And they were both righteous before God. Look at this. They were both righteous. Walking in all of the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. Circle that word blameless. I'm going to come back to that. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren. And they both were now well stricken in years. Now listen, here we learn that these godly people would be the parents of John the Baptist. Now I don't know about you, but John the Baptist is a heavyweight in the New Testament. And know this, the lesson that they would instill in this child from their old age would be the word faultless. Write this down. Timothy learned faith from his mother and grandmother And now, John the Baptist would learn how to be faultless from his parents. What are you talking about, preacher? 
I told you to underscore the word blameless in chapter 1, verse number 6. The word blameless literally means faultless, meaning that these godly parents serve the Lord and their lives, look at this, their lives showed no evidence of sinful behavior. And they raised John the Baptist that way. I, I don't know about you, but it just seems like, have you ever just, everybody watch, everybody watch, come on, come on. Have you ever just known somebody that just seems like their, their walk with God just seems, seems like to be a little bit easier than everybody else's? They just seems to kind of get it. They just seem like that uh, they wake up of a morning and they start singing, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. It just seems like there's some of those people that just walk and, 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 and it just seemed like the stresses and it just seems like the old world just doesn't have a hold on them. And it just seems like they just kind of have an easier time. But here we see John the Baptist's parents. The Bible says there was nothing in their lives that people could point to and say, there's a deficiency, there's a deficiency, there's something in your life that you need to correct. These people were absolutely blameless. They wasn't sinless perfected, but they were blameless. You couldn't go to them and say, there's something in the flaw of your life. Now watch, watch. And because of that, they raised John the Baptist that way. Here was a young baby that was coming into the world that would have a major role in the life of Jesus Christ. But this young boy would raise up in this godly home. Now, everybody watch, everybody watch. Where do you think that some of his influence came from? The reason why Zacharias probably, certainly he had a role, but because he had a high priestly duty to perform, and it took a lot of his time. So guess who had a major impact in John the Baptist? Somebody guess? It was Elizabeth, right? Here was a woman that would teach John the Baptist, and I could just imagine her to say something like this. Now watch this. Now John, you're growing up. And you're going to be responsible for your decisions. Watch. Here, 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 here's statements that you might have heard. Mom and dad can't be there every day, every hour, and every minute. So, John, you're going to have to be responsible. John, you're going to have to know what to do and what not to do. John, there's a lot of writing on you. Your mom and dad's going to love you. We're going to be here for you. But we're older, and we're not going to be here as far as uh, for eternity. So, John, you're going to have to make the right decisions. Well, how do you know that, preacher? Well, let me just tell you this. Probably, if the truth would be told, told, you were told that some point in your life by your parents. Now, look, you're fixing to be a teenager. You're going to get the keys to the car, God forbid, and you're going to have to make the right decisions. You're going to have to come in at the right time. We're going to trust you for this. Now, parents, really, uh, when you hand your key, keys for the first time to your kid, and you tell them, we're going to trust you with this, what's going through that teenage mind? Everybody look up here. What's going through their mind, Tyler? It's not going to be that I'm going to be dependable and mom and dad can trust me. That's what they want you to think that they're telling you. But here's what Tyler's thinking. I got the car! That's what he's thinking. And Boone and Dana sitting there doing like this. Now, 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 Tyler, you, you be home at, at, at 11 o'clock and not one second before. Dana says, Boone, what time it is? And he says, well, it's just five minutes from the last time you asked me that. Why do you keep asking me that? Because Tyler's got the keys. That's why I'm asking you this. John the Baptist was a young man that grew, listen, listen, that grew up in a home that had no obvious flaws, or faults. These were a mom and dad that loved God with all their heart. This was a set of parents. The Bible says they were up in age, and certainly they here's what they knew. We've got to pump into John everything we can because we're not always going to be there for him. We're not always going to be there to, to, to kiss his boo-boos away to bandage his wounds, and to tell him that we love him. We're going to have to show him while he's young so that when he leaves his house, he's going to be equipped to do the things of God. Listen to me, moms and dads. Here's what you need to know. If you do not do anything else, 
you make sure that your children know who Jesus Christ is. Can I tell you something? It's a whole lot easier when they're one to Christ at an early age than it is trying to convince some 24-year-old, 44-year-old, and 50-year-old their need for Christ. I'm not saying it cannot happen. We've seen it here at the church. But I can tell you this. I rejoice when a child is one to the Lord for this reason alone. They have a lifetime to serve Him then. Is anybody listening to me this morning? So here's what John the Baptist's parents knew. They were trying to instill with this young man. And Elizabeth, no doubt, had so much influence on him. And I love that. Now listen to this. Um, I want to show you something in Luke chapter 7 and verse number 26. you got to see this. you got to see this. No doubt his upbringing had a huge influence on the outcome of John and his ministry. Luke chapter 7, Phil, skip down a little bit, you'll find it. Luke chapter 7, verse number 26. Notice what it says in this verse. Powerful passages. And what you went out to see, Jesus is speaking, a prophet. Now watch, watch. Yea, I say unto you much more than a prophet. Watch. This is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messengers before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. Now watch. For I say unto you, Jesus is saying this, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Here's what he was saying. This, Think about this. According to Jesus, John ranked higher than Moses. Wait. What did the Jews think about Moses? Come on, come on, come on. They thought he was it. John the Baptist ranked higher than Abraham. Wow! Can you imagine an average Jew hearing that? He ranked higher than Elisha, than Elijah, and higher than all the major prophets combined. He was greater than those men who brought revival, revival, greater than those who rebuked kings. John was greater than them all. But make no mistake, John's success could be contributed to his godly mother. She, listen, she laid the ground work for this man's success in his life. Wow. Are you still following me so far? Timothy was taught faith. John the Baptist was taught false faultlessness. I don't know about this, but as I was studying preparing for this, this thought came to me. As Elizabeth was an older lady by the time John was born. And when she had John in her arms, do, ladies, look, look. Do you imagine that Elizabeth, when she saw that beautiful child, do you imagine that she started singing to John the Baptist some of those songs of Zion? Come on, come on, come on. Now watch. Do you imagine she read the scripture? To John? Wait a minute. Do you imagine that she read Isaiah to John? Isaiah chapter 40? Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 3 to John? Look what it says. It should be on a screen. Isaiah chapter 40 in verse number 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness... Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our Lord, for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Wow! No, nobody's wowed but me. Now Wait! This was a prophecy about who? John the Baptist. Do you think that maybe Elizabeth... Come on! Do you think maybe Elizabeth saw this and says, Wow! Wow! This is my son. She laid the groundwork for John the Baptist 
to prepare the way of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, <laughs> but wow, this lady had a huge impact. Listen, Jesus says there's not anybody that's been born of woman that's been greater than John the Baptist. You think that Jesus just was having a bad day when he said that? No. You think he meant it? Yeah, I think he meant it. Why? Because there was Elizabeth rocking that baby John and telling him, you're going to be special. God's got a purpose for you. And God's got a divine plan for you. Wow. Maybe some of you have come from a home where your mom, your Christian mom, told you something just exactly like that. And if you are, you are a privileged indeed. All right, let me go to another one right quick before our time's out. We looked at two mama's boys, Timothy and John the Baptist. Let me show you one more. First, Tim, uh, First Samuel chapter 1, verse number 4. First Samuel chapter 1 and verse number 4. Notice what it says. And when the time, look at this, and when the time was at... Hekonai offered and to Peniah, the, his wife, to all the sons and their daughters portions, but unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did year, look at this, and as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Here we see a scene from the life of Hannah, Samuel's mom. Hannah's name, write this in the margin of your Bible. Hannah's name means grace. And just a little bit of information here, and I know everybody in this room knows this. Watch this. Did you know, I was going to put this on the screen, but I figured you could see this in your mind. Watch. Did you know that Hannah's name spelled frontwards and backwards is still the same? Okay, okay, maybe you didn't like that. Now, here's what you're doing. Here's what you're doing. H-A-N-N-A-H and H-A. That's what you're doing right there. Okay, so what? Okay. But Hannah had no children, and we learned that others would provoke her or to remind her of that. Hannah's husband, listen to this, had another wife, and she made it very difficult on Hannah. Hebrew women were blessed through childbirth, and not to have children was considered a grave injustice or even a curse. But here is what she would learn, and here is what she would teach to her son Samuel. She learned how to finish. How to finish. And she taught Samuel that same thing. Listen to this. Today, we don't see that word finish anymore. When, when the kids was little and they wanted to get involved in things in the school, here's what Judy and I would constantly remind them. You're not going to get in the band and quit. If you join this, you're going to finish. Guess what kids do today? I don't want to do that no more. What, come on. And you know what mom and dad says? That's okay, Junior. If you don't want to do that, if you don't feel like doing that, mama understands. No, no, that's not what happens. Finishing is not even taught. Watch, watch. When your faith gets difficult, some of you don't even want to finish. When things get hard on you, you don't want to finish. When it gets poured down upon you, when the old world kind of gets cruel and ugly to you, you want to quit, you want to blame, you want to do everything else but finish. Can I tell you this? What this godly woman Hannah showed Samuel was how to finish things. Here's what she learned. I'm being made fun of because I didn't have children. But here's what she says. I'm still going to serve God. I'm still going to go to the temple. I'm still going to exalt God. Even when I'm not being blessed. Even when I don't have His favor. Even when I don't understand. I'm still going to finish what God has started in me. Wait a minute. Is anybody listening to the preacher this morning? How to finish. How to finish things. Beloved, can I tell you this? God has wrought a good work in you. Tyler, finish what God's done for you. Listen to me. Listen to me, Miss Bernie. Finish what God has done in your life. Don't be a quitter. Don't be known as somebody that's in our community that says they used to be. 
They used to be a member. They used to be a Sunday school teacher. They used to be faithful. No, be somebody that says, look at that, that's my Sunday school teacher. That's somebody that's active in church. That's somebody that loves the Lord. That's somebody that supports missions. That's somebody that has got it all together as far as spiritually is concerned because they don't quit. She taught this young boy, (laughs) Samuel, there's going to be some difficult days ahead of you, but I want you to stay the path. Now watch this. When I started looking at Samuel, did you realize what a difficult ministry he had? He had to deal with kooky King Saul. Does anybody remember that character from the Old Testament? How deranged this guy got? And not only did he have to deal with King Saul, old Samuel had a kind of a, uh, had a, had a, portion had a had an area that he had to go to and minister he was kind of an, a traveling and evangelist if you will an old circuit riding preacher does somebody understand what i just said a circuit riding preacher and samuel would go to spot to spot to spot to spot and he would do all of these things but he knew but he, look, look, look at this he knew that he could not quit he had a responsibility he had a responsibility to to his god first and then he had a responsibility to to, to minister to all of these places and then then he had to put up with King Saul's shenanigans. This guy had a lot on his plate, but he learned from his mother early on. I'm not going to. Wait, wait, wait. I want to hear you say it. I'm not going to quit. Listen to me. There's been many a preacher that has thrown in a towel. There's been many missionaries that used to be faithful to the foreign field. They quit. There used to be some people in the church. They used to be excited. They used to read their Bibles. <laughs> Guess what? They quit. Let me ask you this. What trait are you learning? What trait did you learn from your growing up? Was it that you can quit anytime you wanted to? But did you learn to stay steady? Look at 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse number 2. Look what the Bible says at the end of Samuel's life. you got to see this. At the end of Samuel's life, notice what the Bible says. And now, behold, the king walketh before you, of whom I'm old and gray-headed, and behold, my sons are with you. And Samuel's kind of relaying some things about his life. Watch. And I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold, here I am. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose ass have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? As, look, look, or as whose hands have I received any bribe to blind my eyes therewith? And I will restore it to you. And they said, thou hast not defrauded us nor oppressed us, neither have thou taken aught of thy man's hand. And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is a witness against this day, that you have not found aught in my hand. And they answered, He is witness. You know what he was saying? I have served you for a lifetime. From my youth, now even I'm an old man. And I want to tell you what I'm telling you. I never quit on the things that God told me to do. Is somebody listening to the preacher? I never quit. Even when I wanted to quit. Even when times get hard. Even when things were told to me that I thought was ugly. And when I was abused. And when I was talked about. And when people slandered my name. Let me tell you this. Do you not think some of those things happened to Samuel? You know what he was saying now in these verses? I'm looking back over all my life. And I did not quit. Wow, that's a message for our hour. One more mama's boy, and we're done. One more mama's boy. Second Kings chapter 22, and we're done. Second Kings chapter 22. Look at the next mama's boy. <clears throat> Timothy taught faith. John the Baptist was taught to be faultless, and Samuel was taught to be a finisher. Second Kings 22.1. Joash was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned thirty and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedidiah, uh, the daughter of Adaiah, and Boscot. And he did which was right in the sight of the Lord, look, and walked in the way of David his father, and turned not from the side to the right hand nor to the left. Now listen to this. 
before Joash was ever born, it was prophesied that he would bring about a radical reform of God's people. This man would be special. But what about his mother? Look, look at her name, the name Jedediah. Uh, Joash's mother means to be beloved of the Lord. Everybody look at me. Did you get that? His mother's name means to be beloved of the Lord. Joash's dad, Amnon, died, and now he assumed the throne at eight years old. I don't know about you, but how many eight years olds are qualified to be king? And guess who he needed strong in his corner? His mom. His godly mother would teach his son, here's our fourth truth and our last truth, to be focused. She taught him to be focused. Look, if you will, at Second Kings chapter 2, verse number 10, very quickly. And Saphan, the scribe, show, uh, showed the king, saying, Helkali, the priest, hath delivered me a book. And Saphan read it before the king, and it came to pass that when the king heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Achan the son of Shaphan, and Achor, and Shaphan the scribe, and the servant of the king, saying, Go ye and acquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. Here we see in a very important lesson. The word of God had been neglected and the house of the Lord had been torn down. And listen to this. And it absolutely broke the king's heart. And where do you suppose he learned the focus on the words of God and the house of God? Somebody tell me. From his godly mom. His earthly father was dead. His earthly father was a rat. And he still had his mother to encourage him to guide this boy king. He purposed in his heart that he would be a righteous king from early on. And where do you think he got that? From his mom. Notice, if you will, 2 Kings 23, 2. Hurry. 2 Kings 23, 2. And the king went up to the house of the Lord and all of the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great, Don't miss this. Don't miss it. If I have to skip the rest of it, I want you to see this. Watch. The Bible says, all the men of Judah, look at this, the priest and the prophets and all the people were there. Look what the king did. I've never caught this before until I saw this and the light bulb went on. Look what happened. Look what happened. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. You see, the king did not have the Scriptures read to them. He read the Scriptures to them. Wow! Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where do you think that Joash learned the Scriptures from? Dad's dead. Do you think that Mama, Jedekiah, the lady that raised this boy, do you think that maybe she had something to do with him loving the Word of God? Yeah. Listen, he could have told one of these prophets or one of these priests, I want you to stand up and I want you to read the God, read the Word of God to this godless bunch of people that we have, we have not done what this book says. Instead, he says, I'm going to take it my responsibility and I'm going to read the Word of God to the people. Where? Did he learn such traits? Well, we know it wasn't from dad because he's in the grave. It had to be from mom. Listen to this. I'll skip this, but I want to show you something. Some of the reforms that he did. Go to 2 Kings, if you will, chapter 23. 2 Kings chapter 23. I'm not going to read verses 4 through 6. talks about a lot of the reforms. Skip down to verse number 7. 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse number 7. And he break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord. And the women uh, wove hangings for the grove. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places which the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba and break down the high places of the gates that were entered and the gate of Ju- uh, Judy, J- uh, Joshua and the governor of the city, which were of the men's left hand of the gate of the city. What was, what, what, what was he doing this? He was purging the land all of all iniquity. Wouldn't it be great if we had leaders just like that today that would decide to read the Word of God themselves and not just some interpretation? 
somebody that would stand and rid the, the, the land of all of the iniquities. Let's go in there now. In World War II, there was a general named General Gavin who was very popular with his men for one reason. Whenever he sent them into combat, he was at the head of the line. Wherever his paratroopers would jump, he always was the first to jump from the airplane. He was so intent on setting the example for his men that, listen listen to what he did, that he had his stars placed on the back of his helmet so that his men could see who was at the head of the line. At one point during the war, he was ordered by General Patton to remove the stars from the back of his helmet and put them to the front. He publicly told his men of Patton's orders and that he publicly disobeyed that order because he wanted his men to know that he would always go first into battle. My friend, this was exactly the kind of king Joash had become. A man that was not going to ask somebody to do something that he was not willing to do. But can I tell you this? After all of the reforms that he made, it was because of his godly mother. Now listen to this. I understand that some of you could stand up here in and, and more time than, than, than we have allowed to this morning. And you could tell me stories of how your mother has impacted your life. Maybe there's a story that she told you. Or maybe as a youngster, you just watched her life. Maybe you just glared from some things. But maybe she taught you, and watch this, instead of dropping you off at Sunday school, maybe she took you to Sunday Amen. school. Amen. Maybe instead of telling you to read the Bible, maybe she read the Bible to you. Maybe instead of telling you what to do, maybe she modeled what to do in front of you. And because of that, you are here today because some of the godly influences of your mother. We've looked at some mama's boys this morning. We saw Timothy learn faith. We saw John the Baptist learn not to be fault to learn to be faultless. We saw Samuel learn to be a finisher. And we saw, saw jo- Joash learn to have focus. Focus in the difficult time of cleaning up the land. And can I tell you this, when you read that story about Joash, the opposition that he had, can I tell you this? There are some people that enjoy the filth of the land. And they did not want to have these religious reforms coming about. And can I tell you, it's the same thing today. That's right. That's absolutely right. Mama's boys in the scripture. I could have picked out many, many, many more. But these give us a snapshot of some important things that their mothers taught these young men. What about you? Miss Dana, would you come? What about you? What are some lessons that to this day that you've not learned your lesson well enough and maybe you just need to have a little bit of time of contemplation. Maybe your mother has prayed for you over and over and over and over down through the years. And maybe you're sitting here today and maybe your mom's already in glory. And maybe you're already thinking these things. Have I been true to what she taught me? Have I followed the precepts and the word of the living God as she told me so many times before? Have I been a disappointment to her and the testimony that she's left me? The greatest thing that you can do if your mom's living or if your mom has already passed, is to know that Jesus Christ is center point of your life. Not some wishy-washy Christ thing that you just do when you get into trouble. I'm talking about a relationship that is real in the good times and in the bad. I'm talking about a relationship that helps you and props you up when no one else will. I'm talking about a Savior who has given you everything in the world to make you spiritually successful. And yet many times we're so hard-headed we've turned our backs. Would you close your eyes and just bow your head just for a moment?
going to give you a time. Just a time of where you need to be spiritually. Think about your mom here just for a moment. What was the impact that she left in your life? If she's already passed on, can you still hear her voice? Saying, son, come on, let's do a little bit better than that. You know you don't need to be doing that. 